Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Matt Feldman, founder of Moku Foods. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Grace. Great to be here. Thank you for being on the show. So um, tell us about your journey and how you started Moku Foods. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, it all started back just growing up in Hawaii on Oahu and I spent a lot of time outdoors and was very passionate about the environment and sustainability from a young age. And I think growing up on an island, you know, we just feel more responsible for our actions and how it impacts both, you know, the island and, and the planet in general. So I knew from an early age that I would want to start my own business centered around sustainability. You know, fast forward, um, I went to school actually for finance, but ended up working in tech in the Bay Area. And I was kind of just waiting for the next idea to pop up. Um, and in 2018, I had watched a documentary called What the Health on Netflix, and it inspired me to try out a vegan diet. So, you know, I ate completely plant-based for two weeks, you know, assessed how I felt. And for me, you know, my energy levels were, were higher. Um, you know, my physical shape was better. Spiritual, spirit, like spiritual connection was, was better. So I adopted, you know, a plant-based lifestyle from there. Um, and that was kind of what spurred everything. Wonderful. So how long has it been that you've been plant-based? It's been seven years so far. Wow. So why, uh, why mushrooms? Why mushroom jerky? Is there a specific yeah. connection you had to mushrooms or? So when I was, when I switched to plant-based, I had started a vegan meetup in San Francisco just because I knew really nothing about veganism. I didn't know anyone that was vegan. And I was really just trying to learn more and garner a community. And I had everyone that came uh, bring a snack or, you know, a plate of food or something that they can make. And for me, I, you know, I was looking for a savory snack. And since I couldn't eat meat jerky, I started making mushroom jerky from my house, just using an online recipe and, you know, sampled it out to family and friends. And I chose mushrooms just because I was looking for something meaty, something that had that meat-like texture. But I'm also intolerant to both uh, gluten and soy. So mushrooms were that perfect medium of being meaty, you know, good for the, our bodies and also good for the planet. And then in terms of the mushrooms, you guys use king oyster mushrooms for your jerky? Yep, king oyster, also called king trumpet. So the king oyster, why was that the perfect mushroom for your jerky versus, say, like just normal oyster mushrooms or... The other types of mushrooms yeah so when i started off i was making portabella mushroom jerky and when i decided to pursue it as a business uh, i ended up finding a michelin star chef in berkeley oh, by wow. the name of thomas bowman and he, he was one of the people who created just egg so he was you know very involved with you know plant-based foods and plant-based alternatives and and um he was, you know, helping me play around with a bunch of different mushrooms. And we landed on king oyster because the, the stem of the king oyster is very meaty. And portobello and, you know, shiitake are also good. But, you know, in terms of price and meaty texture, the king oyster mushroom was the perfect one. Yeah. And where do you source your mushrooms from? Are they grown in the United States or abroad? They're grown abroad. So we, we source them from an indoor farm in China. And this farm grows them organically indoors um, on logs. So we, we test for everything, but since they're not grown in soil, there's no heavy metals or anything like that. Um, and what's cool about what I learned about king oyster mushrooms and many other mushrooms is that they can't use chemicals to grow. Like it's physically impossible because, you know, I wanted to, the first thing I wanted to make sure was that they, there was no synthetic fertilizers or pesticides being used. And what's great is that the mushrooms can't grow in chemicals. So um, it was nice to know that, you know, that wasn't even an option. Um, no, that's great because I mean, a lot of people, they're eating beef jerky and they don't realize how many toxic metals there are in, um, you know, beef jerky just by the nature of, you know, what the cows are eating and everything. So, um, you know, that's great that to know that, you know, when you're eating local jerky, that has nothing that could be dangerous like that, you know? Absolutely. Some plant-based foods, you know, like rice, it takes up arsenic, um, mm -hmm. you know, so you have to be very careful where you buy your rice and everything too. So, you know, even if you're trying to be healthy and not eat, you know, um, animal products, you could still end up getting toxic metal um, 
in your body. You know? mm-hmm. um, so tell me about the, you know, do, do you dehydrate the mushrooms? Do you, um, like, what's the process? Um, I, I don't want to necessarily have you give away trade secrets, but just the basics. Yeah. So when we started, it, it took a long time for us to nail down the texture because with mushroom jerky, they, it, it typically either comes out too wet and sticky or too hard. And it's really hard to get the marinade to adhere completely into the mushrooms and, and cook it in a way that leaves it both chewy, but also dry enough to where it doesn't clump together in the bag or doesn't leave your hands you know, all sticky. So uh, we actually worked with both Thomas as well as another Michelin star chef and product developer named Ali Buzari. And um, he helped us, you know, optimize our process to where it was different than all the other vegan and mushroom jerkies um, to taste as much like meat jerky as possible. So without giving too much away, we, you know, we use the king oyster mushrooms and then we have a marinade that consists of, you know, so it's a soy free, gluten free, vegan marinade. So we use um, alternatives like coconut aminos, chickpea miso, our natural sweeteners, maple syrup. Um, we use fermented rice extract for, you know, umami. And we have a three-step cooking process that makes our jerky very different from, um, you know, other jerkies. And, mm-hmm. you know, it took a long time to commercialize and develop, but it's paid off because we feel we have the, the meatiest jerky that's, you know, tastes really good, but doesn't compromise on the ingredient label or the price. You know, we're priced mm-hmm. very competitively with, with beef jerky. Yeah. So uh, tell me, um, you know, when you say we, is do you have any co-founders or is this just basically you? And then you looked up a whole bunch of Michelin um, chefs and got them to participate? Or what do you mean when you say we? For the most part, when I say we, I'm referring to myself. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's it, it feels like we're just getting started because it's our first year in retail stores. But the journey started, you know, back in 2018. So it's been half a decade for me in this. And, you know, from the beginning, I've had, I've worked with a lot of different people, you know, uh, you know, worked in the beginning with, you know, an advisor who, you know, kind of introduced me to a lot of people in the food world. And then I met Thomas, him and I worked together for a year before he started his company. And then I had a, an initial co-founder who was a great help for the, you know, she was around for the first two years. And then, um, you know, I've hired people on the marketing side, but now I have a, a COO who I recently brought on board in May. Um, he, he's not full full time, but he's around a lot and he's helped a lot on the financial side and the operating side. But um, it's funny, I do, th- I do get that question for whatever reason, I just always refer to the company as we, just because <laughs> I try to separate myself from the company so that I am not the company, you know, that, that'll probably be a little too unhealthy, but um, I have had a lot of help on the, along the way. It's not just myself. And so um, I, I can't remember how I heard about your company, but I've been ordering, you know, every once in a while, I order like a box and in bulk. And I'm wondering, um, you know, your packaging, I, I know there was something on the website too, that you're working on more sustainable packaging. Um, what kind of ideas do you have for more sustainable packaging? Because, or I don't know if you could, um, another thing is I was thinking, could you put more in a bag? I mean, because I think, people might want more than a single serving bag. I mean, I, I eat them so lots of times. I'll take them to work and I'll eat one like over the course of my shift or whatever. Um, so, you know, I mean, I feel like you could make like a bigger serving bags maybe, and then you would use less of the pa- like the packaging, you know? No. Yeah. Great question. I'll start with the first one. So like, ideally we would be using compostable packaging. One that, you know, you throw into the landfill and eventually you know, turns into compost and, you know, dirt, but unfortunately, like jerky in and of itself needs to have a long shelf life, at least a year. So Mm -hmm. the, the material can't break down too soon. So there, there isn't an available bag, at least that we know of that's around that is both, you know, durable for at least a year and compostable. So then the other option is recyclable, but we haven't found a recyclable bag that people can um, throw into their blue bin, you know, their curbside blue bin. The the recyclable option right now is a industrial recyclable, which means you have to ship back the bag 
to a specific, you know, warehouse yeah. or bring it back to the store. And that's great and all, but 99% of people don't do that. And what they do is they think it's, you know, curbside recyclable. So they throw it in their blue bin, but then when it gets picked up, they see that it's not curbside recyclable and then they dispose of the whole thing in landfill. So that option is more expensive and it usually does more harm than good. So we're in a place now where we're kind of waiting. It's not really up to us to create the the bag. You know, we're we're focused on producing a more sustainable and healthier jerky um, compared to meat jerky. But, you know, with that said, as soon as there is a viable option on the um, packaging side, like we're going to jump on it. And then um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, bulk sizes, yeah, we have a two ounce, two serving bag, um, but we're also working on a 10 ounce bulk bag, which oh, was all on, yeah, a lot of people have been demanding that. So it's about time, but um, hopefully we'll be launching that in Costco in the next year. And then we'll also be selling well, that'd it. that'd be awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. So still Costco. Um, so, you know, a lot of things at Costco, though, they, I guess they just launch at Costco, but then they are not available at Costco anymore. I mean, I, yeah. I guess there's a number of factors, like sometimes if something doesn't have a certain amount of sales, then the Costco store won't repeat order it. Um, and then some people just want to launch at Costco. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Costco's tricky. Just like you said, you know, if you launch and you don't do well, like they cut you immediately and it's very hard to get back in. And it's mm -hmm. also, you also have to prepare on the material side for scale at Costco. So when you do your nine week test, you know, you have to prepare for further than nine weeks out. So you're buying material that you might only be able to use at Costco since it's all bulk sizes. And if they cut you, then you're left with tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of material. So um, it's tricky for brands at our stage to get into Costco, but on the other end of the spectrum, you know, if you do do well at Costco, you know, it could change everything. Like it's, there's, it's so much more volume than Whole Foods or your, you know, grocery store accounts. So it's, it's tricky. Like it, it really depends on how far you are in, how well capitalized your business is and, um, and if you think you can handle it, because a lot of people say, a lot of the experts in the industry say like, it's not about like getting into Costco. It's, it's about whether you can continue going, moving if they, if they continue, if they bring you on after the test. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, whenever we see a plant-based product at Costco, we always try to support it because it's yeah. really sad. I mean, they had stuff like really good things, kale chips. Um, and then, you know, you're so excited, you buy a ton of it, but then they don't continue it. It's, really, yeah. it's terrible, you know? Um, so I, I, I know there's a lot of competition, but um, I wish you guys best of luck in that. Um, I do want to go over your website. Uh, Michael, if you could show some of the different varieties of jerky they have, and if you could um, just go through the different varieties you have, Matt. Yeah, for sure. So the original three were original. Uh, Hawaiian teriyaki and sweet and spicy and with this we were looking at how to incorporate you know the Hawaii roots which is obviously where I grew up and also being native Hawaiian and also incorporating you know traditional jerky flavors so we felt we had a wide array of flavors from original like your classic onion pepper garlic um, flavors and then teriyaki which has your ginger garlic pineapple and then sweet and spicy, which is, you know, sweetened with maple syrup and then a, a cayenne spice at the end. And then as we were thinking about new flavors, um, you know, we were thinking about one, what like flavors are big in Hawaii, as well as what flavors are, you know, big in the U.S. outside in Hawaii in the mainland. And Korean barbecue is like the first one that came to mind because it's very popular in Hawaii, but also like getting very popular on the mainland and that's been our most popular flavor it's a newer flavor so we haven't it's launched stores yet. that's my favorite yeah yeah it's favorite. really good it has that sesame teriyaki in that one yeah 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 the gojujang it's it's really good and then um and then the maui onion is um we recently launched that one a few months mm -hmm. ago and just a small batch launch on our website and that sold out within the first week so we're going to make that a permanent flavor come like november december and then mm -hmm. just uh, two days ago, we launched our lemon pepper, 
which um, okay. we had a lot of demand for like a, a, a pepper flavor. So we went the citrus route with lemon pepper and, and it's a good one. It's, it's very distinct from the other flavors, but I feel like that's one that people are going to absolutely love or they might not care for it's 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 gonna be yeah. one of the yeah. i really like it but um you know it's, i feel like you either like the lemon flavor or you don't yeah yeah do you think you're going to ever get into other types of mushrooms um or you think you'll just stick with the oyster the king oysters so the the second product that we're launching is a stick so if you go to you know a grocery store or a gas station, there's a lot of beef sticks, um, yes. as well as yeah. like chicken sticks. It's like meat sticks are huge in the U.S. And we found that there were no plant-based versions of it. Mm -hmm. So you know last year we started, we worked with a, a product developer on creating a stick that tasted like meat, but had and it had the same macros. So 10 grams of protein, you know, low in sugar all that and that's that product will launch in early next year um and it's made it's made, that one's made from wheat uh it's made from wheat potato protein mushrooms and coconut oil and flavor like spices and, and different flavoring um mm -hmm. we couldn't get the mushrooms to be like the the main ingredient it's just the texture we want it the ultimate goal is is to replace beef jerky or you know an option for yeah. people that are cutting cutting back on red meat Mm -hmm. or meat in general so um wheat was our best option you know mm -hmm. obviously like we, we would want to be um inclusive to all you know people that are have allergens but yeah. overall we're, we want to hit the masses we want to be in you know convenience stores and gas stations around the country so that's going to yeah. be our next product um but and we're also working on a bacon bits product which is similar to our mushroom jerky but it's cooked okay. a little more a little crispier and and, and uh, shredded into bits so that one, you know, would be, we'd probably sell it in stores, but it would be in uh, restaurants, you know, in salad bars, a topping oh, on salads, yeah. mac and cheese, pizza. Mm -hmm. No, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, it's great that you guys are branching out and doing more products um, and you have so many ideas. Um, I'm wondering in terms of the, I know you said your production plant um, was in Illinois and now it's in North Carolina. Does the product ship from there to all around the um, United States? Um, yeah. So we have we have our main facility that we uh, contract manufacture from in Illinois. We've been working with them since we launched, and then with mm -hmm. some of these other products that we're working on, um, we're working with a facility in North Carolina. So uh, we have both of those. We're onboarding the second one. I'm I'm out here in North Carolina right now. Um, but the one in Illinois ships everywhere. So they also have like a fulfillment center attached to the, to the facility. So, you know, once they make the jerky, then they can ship it off to our, our website customers. We ship it off to the Amazon fulfillment centers. Um, and most of the, you know, grocery stores we work with, they have distributors. So we'll send, you know, bulk um, boxes to distributors who then distribute to grocery stores. So um, it's, yeah, it's that one center plant that kind of ships it all. Okay, that's cool. I mean, we're just wondering, because I, at first I didn't know, because it said you were from Hawaii. I thought maybe it shipped from Hawaii, but it didn't seem to ship from Hawaii, so. Yeah, I mean, I wish. I wish we, I could do everything from Hawaii, but the fact of the matter is the mushrooms we use don't grow in Hawaii. Yeah, um, I know. And it's, we're very it's strict cute. about the kind of mushrooms they like grow here, too. Yeah, it's hard to also get manufacturing space in, in Hawaii, too. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's, that's wonderful that you're able to, you know, um, I'm wondering, how about other countries? Are you guys doing other countries as well yet? Not yet. We've had a lot of interest in Canada, but mm -hmm. um, most of Canada requires the, the, um, the bilingual packaging, both French and, and English. Oh, um, I didn't realize that'd be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're like, when we do the trade shows, there's always, you know, people from other countries that are interested, but we want to just like, you know, have a solid foundation here in, in the U.S. first. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we're like big enough, because also like, you know, food margins are thin. And when you have to ship it overseas, like your margins just um, get reduced even more. So I think once we're at a scale where our margins are better, then, you know, it'll make sense to ship overseas. 
Yeah, yeah. So are you learning this all as you go along? Or did you, um, I know you said you had a background in tech and finance, but it's really, I mean, you, you look really young. And I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> um, no, I, I wasn't in the food space before. Uh, I was in, I was working at a, a software company, but the food world, it's, it's not that complicated in terms of like understanding how it all works, but it is, there's a lot of issues with the food, how food is distributed and, and how, like all the margins, like you really, you really need to make the food for, you need to have high margins because there are so many people along the way that get a cut. So like, yeah. to give you an example, when you make the product, you know, you're paying the people to put it in boxes and um, they call it's called a kidding fee. So like, mm -hmm. you know, when they make the product, they're throwing it in boxes and every, every time they touch it, you're paying for that. So then once it's in the box, you know, you ship it out to a distributor mm -hmm. and then they take, you know, anywhere from 18 to 30%. And then they ship it to a retailer who takes uh -huh. anywhere from 30 to 50%. Yeah. But even before that, you typically we have to work with a broker to get you into a retailer who takes uh -huh. five percent so at the end of the, uh, and then you have to the retailers make you um pay for promos so you have to uh -huh. put your product on promotion you have to pay for demoing the product you have yeah. to pay for um any returns so at the end of the day there's very little margin for the actual brands and that's why so many brands have to raise capital early on uh -huh. or just like you know, they, they compromise on their ingredients and use very cheap ingredients, which compromises, you know, on the health. So that finding the medium of having a product that's affordable and also healthy and delicious, mm -hmm. like it's really tough. It takes a lot of time, but that's, that's what we're striving to do. Yeah, no, I mean, it would be nice to cut out all the middlemen. Like, I guess if you get to scale a large scale, then can't you have your own distribution and your own, um, um, I don't know. Well, yeah, sure. sort, sort of. So to work with the Whole Foods and the Foodlands and all the grocery stores down to earth, like they all, you can't work directly. They they all go through a distributor. But once you get to the Costco's and the Walmarts and the Targets, you work directly with them. They have their own distribu distribution. So yeah, awesome. you cut out the distributors. So that's why like you know, that's where all the brands make their money, but you can't just start in those stores because you need to build yeah. brand awareness and have a loyal following before they'll take you in. So it's one of those things where like, it just takes a long time to develop the brand. And it's basically like starts as a baby and it like grows up. Like it doesn't, it's very rare for a brand to explode overnight. It, sometimes it may look like that from the outside, but you know, they've been working three, four, five years before it gets to that point. Yeah. I mean, when you first started, did you start in San Francisco then initially? Yeah. And I, when I started, I thought in my mind, I was like, if I can make a really good mushroom jerky, then I'll sell to Whole Foods and make a ton of money. But that's not how it works <laughs> like, at all. Like you're, I don't want to scare anyone listening that wants to enter the industry because, you know, this shouldn't discourage you, but you have to like you're losing money for the first couple of years because it's so expensive to play the game. You know, like a lot of these, a lot of these stores too, they charge you to get it, get in. It's like, you're almost yeah. paying for the merchandising space and then you have to do extremely well to even stay there. So mm -hmm. in order to make a profit, like you have to be a couple of years in or have insane margins. Like if your margins are really good, you know, for beverages and pro protein powder and things like that, margins are better, but for food margins are thin. So yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's a tough game, but I, I've learned it all on the way. Like, you know, mm -hmm. just like making a ton of mistakes, um, learning from those mistakes, bringing on people who are smart that I can learn from just kind of like every day, le like failing and learning. <laughs> no, that's great. I think you guys have a great product and I really hope you succeed. I mean, I've been, I've, I've been ordering stuff from your website for, I've, feel like a while now um i didn't realize you guys just started in 2018 so um can we show his instagram as well um is that the best place to go or your website for you know suppose people want to sign up 
um, get news about new flavors, deals, or, you know, where you guys are going to be, where's the best place? Yeah, I would say follow us on Instagram, go to our website, sign up for a newsletter. You'll hear when we have, you know, deals or collaborations, uh, new products, new flavors. And then also, like, like, you know, we're on Amazon Prime as well. So um, if you nice. want uh, the fast shipping, we have all of our flavors on there. Oh, no, Amazon Prime is great. I didn't know you guys were on there. Um, what is the best thing so you guys, um, you know, make the most, I guess, if someone wanted to really support you to, you know, where you get the most pro um, profit? Is it from the your actual website? Yeah, it's from our website, but the most important channel for us right now is Whole Foods because we're in um, California and Hawaii. On Oahu, we're, I think we're in the Kahala one, but um, I, I don't know. It's been like a month or two since I've been home, but uh, we're in the Ward one, we're in the Kailua one. Uh, so that's, that's probably, if you're local, that's probably the best place just because our review for the national rollout is December. So like our uh, numbers now really matter. But if you're not buying Whole Foods, then like our website, it, you know, is the best place there. So Matt, I know that you are involved in contributing some money to nonprofits. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So we donate 1% of our revenue to four nonprofits that customers get to choose from at checkout on our website. The first one is uh, Grow Good. They're an urban farm in Los Angeles, which does community events and helps feed um, you know, local communities in need that don't have access to healthy food. We also donate to a nonprofit called Rewild Your Campus, and they eliminate toxic herbicides from college campuses, uh, high schools. They, they actually got the entire um, uh, public school system in Hawaii to eliminate toxic herbicides. Wow. And then we also we also donate to two nonprofits in Hawaii. One of them is called Waipa on Kauai, and they they teach kids how to grow their own food. They also grow food for the community, so people can come pick it up either for free or for discounted prices. Um, they have an awesome organic farm there. And then we also donate to Aloha Harvest, which um, you know they take donated meals and give them out to families in need. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's, we wanted to have, you know, have our roots in Hawaii and, and support some of the nonprofits doing awesome work there, but also, you know, support other nonprofits that, you know, align with our mission and ethos. No, I think that's great because a lot of uh, people who uh, don't have the means, they don't have access to healthy food. So it's good that, you know, your company is doing something for these people. Thank you so much. Uh, we're out of time, so we have to wrap it up. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We've been talking with Matt Feldman, founder of Moku Foods. Thanks to Michael, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of the crew at Think Tech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you in two weeks for more of Healthy Planet on Think Tech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. My guest will be Brian Trupo, co-founder of Trupo Treats. We will be talking about vegan chocolate. If you uh, have ideas for the show or questions for my future show guests, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at gracenhawaii.com or Instagram at gracefulliving365 for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>